Hi, I'm Natalie Jill, fat loss expert turned high performance coach. When odds are stacked against us, how do we shift and create everything from nothing? How do we level up when we aren't feeling it yet or we've had a big setback? On this podcast, I'll be talking to some of the most inspiring and courageous men and women on this planet who at their worst learned how to achieve success greater than they ever dreamed possible. Leveling up and creating everything from nothing. What happens when your high school sweetheart who you've loved and known and who you've had three kids with becomes a big time athlete, marries a Kardashian and changes? Meet Liza Morales, who is the mother of Lamar Odom's children. Today on Leveling Up, she hopes that by sharing her story, she'll be able to connect with other families dealing with the impact of addiction. I've got a special guest today on Leveling Up. I'm so excited to talk to Liza Morales today. And this is going to be an awesome conversation because Liza was engaged to a professional athlete. She's got some kids with him. And on the outside, she looked like she was on top of the world. People would have envied her lifestyle. They would have looked up to this. And what people didn't know is what she was carrying and what she was going through. And I am so excited to get into this chat today, Liza. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited too. Um, I know we were supposed to speak before and we're finally speaking, so I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy. Technical challenges, but we're here now. <laughs> and we're here yeah. interviewing on a Friday, by the way. Uh, this is not airing on a Friday, but we're interviewing on a Friday, which I don't usually do that with anyone. So you're special. Hey. I'm excited to chat with you. Yeah. Yes. So Liza, take me back. Like, who were you when things started changing? I know people thought you were living this one life and things, other things were going on. Take us back. Who were you? What was happening? Right. Yeah. So I was in ninth grade growing up in Queens, went to high school in Queens, Christ the King, a little shout out to them. Um, and I actually met Lamar there. We were in the same homeroom and um, we were friends for a couple of years. And then um, we started dating like our junior year. Like okay. Year. And everything was good, you know. Um, my mom was very charismatic, and um, I felt like we right away we kind of, you know, it was easy breezy. Everything was cool. Um, and then we kind of, I mean, we grew up together, you know. Um, mm -hmm. and, and things kind of, I'd say after high school, things definitely started to pick up. Okay. Um, yeah, I was supposed to go to college, and I kind of had a whole do I, don't I take out a student loan, whatever. So I was, mm -hmm. while I was trying to figure that out, I sat out a semester of school. Okay. And pregnant with our daughter, Destiny. Okay. And so were you in high school, like dating him? Were, were you like high school sweethearts? Was it like people, like, tell me what that was. Yeah, we were high school sweethearts. And then he actually left our senior year of high school, which was, I think traumatized me to be a little strong word compared to what has happened later on in life. Okay. But um, that was really difficult because you know, we were high school sweethearts and then his senior high school, he went to another school. Senior mm. year. Um, so that was really tough. But we stayed in contact um, back then. You know, I don't want to age myself too much here, but we, we had beepers. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. Look, I'm 48. I lived in the beeper world. I get it. Beeper, the phaser. So we had that stage and you know, we stayed in contact. And then, um, yeah, then, you know, then eventually we graduated high school, but we always still kind of stayed together. And, okay. Yeah. And did you know when you were dating him in high school, like I'm assuming he was an athlete in high school, did you know that yeah. that was, okay. So you were already knew that this was going to be an athlete lifestyle and you were prepared for this. No, um, okay. I didn't know what an athlete lifestyle was really, you know, mm -hmm. I was a little naive to that. I knew obviously he played basketball. Yes. I never went to any of the high school games. Um, okay. Yeah, that just wasn't my thing. Um, so, but look, yeah, he played basketball in high school. I knew that, uh, I mean, he was super tall. And I think he came back like the following year, like taller. Yeah, uh, tall basketball player, very unheard of. I'm just kidding. <laughs> surprising. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like he, um, I'm sorry, I lost my, my, my train of thought. Oh, but yeah, I knew, obviously I knew that Lamar had talent and okay. know how far he was going to go. Okay. So then you get pregnant with your first and what, how old were you? Were you were not in school at this time? What was happening? That was difficult because I was really, I was trying to figure myself out, you know, yep. um, and I was supposed to go to St. John's university here in, in Queens, New York and got pregnant with Destiny at 18, had her at 19. So, mm, life changing yeah. right there. Yes. Cause you're a teenage mom. Absolutely. That was really difficult because my mom was extremely disappointed in me mm -hmm. and I'm 
close to my mom, still am. And so that was that was difficult. It was difficult in my household, um, very difficult. You know, she really wasn't talking to me. Just obviously she wanted another path, obviously. Sure. Um, until our daughter was born and then she melted my mom and my mom um, actually changed her working schedule. My mom was a nurse, she's retired now. Mm. Was a nurse and she actually changed, she worked the night shift so I can go back to school. So was, was Lamar supportive of you having your the first daughter? He he was. I mean, he didn't. You know, he didn't ask me to. You know, um, get rid of her or anything like that. Yeah. So he, he was supportive. I mean, we knew we were so young. We were kind of trying to figure out what do we do here. You know, we, yeah. we were both. Um, and he knew my mom was obviously very disappointed, and so I was already. I was in this mental state with this, because I knew I was disappointing my mom. Sure. So hard, but you're doing a right thing. You're, I mean, you brought, you're bringing your daughter into the world. So that's, that's a, I can only imagine what you were struggling with right then. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So you have her, you have this daughter and then what's happening with you and him and your relationship there. He, at this time he was, a, he was in college. So at okay. this point we're going to, he was at Rhode Island and Rhode Island to New York, it's only a few hours of, of drive. So um, he would kind of go back and forth or we would go up to Rhode Island. Um, and you know, he, he loved Destiny. He swore that this was like his mom reincarnated. Um, you know, Lamar lost his mom really young at like 12 and he's an only child. So I think, yes, we were kind of, you know, struggling with, yes, we're having our, our daughter so young, but at the same time, he was like, I'm having a daughter and you know, it's just more love and more love for him. So I know he kind of was going through that, but we were very just naive, you know, and, and just young and just you know, loved each other and we had. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. So then what happens? Um, he is in Rhode Island for a, a little bit over a year and then he decided he wanted to go into the NBA and he wanted okay. to. Okay. And this was like 99, maybe 2000. And, um, he ends up getting drafted, ends up getting drafted to the Clippers, the Los Angeles Clippers. Now this is like the old Los Angeles. Okay. Clippers. Yeah, this is like the Donald Sterling Clippers. Yep. They weren't what they are now. Um, and to me, it was scary because it was L.A. You know, was sure. That was extremely scary. And he actually begged me and to please come with me. You know, I need my family. Um, and so me, you know, at the time now, I'm 20 now. Mm-hmm. Uh, year old daughter. And I wanted a family. You know, I came from a broken home. Mm-hmm. Um, and so as did he. Um, and so I wanted our little family. And so I, sure. LA, left my friends, my support, my mom, and From New York, there. which is the big yeah. change right there. Yep. Huge change moved across the country with our daughter. And, um, and that was difficult, you know, because it, it seems glamorous, right? It seems like, wow, you know, you're living in LA, you're living in, uh, Marina Del Rey and, and you know, you're the youngest couple in this community uh, in our building, mm-hmm. and um, but it was tough because he was on the road a lot, all that other stuff, you know. And, and he was bonding with teammates, and I had no play to bond with. And yeah. Um, but he knew that I was kind of struggling with being lonely, so he actually flew a cousin of mine out, and so okay. my cousin was living with us and keeping me company. So that okay, was good. Um, and you know. Then things started to change and, 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 you know, the lifestyle kind of, you know, where it seems so glamorous from the outside, but it can take hold of you. And that did. Tell me what that means. Like, what is that lifestyle and what was happening? The going out, you know, the nightlife, Mm -hmm. um, the women, um, you know, when Lamar was in college, I was in New York raising our daughter. So I was removed from the college campus. Mm -hmm. Lifestyle. So who knows what was happening in college? And then obviously he gets to the league and it's obviously magnified. But now I was witnessing that. You know, I would go to restaurants with him and women would come up to him, look right past me. Yeah. Um, and what those, were you feeling when that was happening? Because that's that's stressful. I would imagine. Like, are you were you feeling hate? Were you feeling jealous? Were you what what was coming up for you around that? Um it depends. You know, I mean, just woman to woman, of course, you know, you're seeing some of these women that are beautiful and, mm-hmm. you know, you, you could be as confident as you can be, but, you know, mind you, I'm 20 years old here. Yeah. And 
still trying to figure myself out. And and you're a new mom, so like that really just, hits you. Yeah. And I'm a new mom. And um it, it was tough, you know, but I wasn't necessarily hateful. I would say I was I did feel at times obviously disrespected, like hello. Yeah. There, there were times where I kind of did feel like I would shift my body towards the woman like I'm here. Hey, I'm you here. I, I see <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, and he would notice that and he would try to, you know, keep the cool, you know, totally. he would try. Yeah. He would totally try to, he, he was not going to. So I, I've had that experience. It's almost like for me, I would like start feeling a little insecure and then you feel like guilty for that. You know, like, did you like, but I think the good thing is that he never let the women disrespect me. Like he okay. knew even from then, like, okay, I can't have them disrespect lies. So yeah. he would, when I wasn't there, obviously things were, obviously I would find out would occur. But when I was there with him, I yeah. was like, they call it. It's so funny. There's like a term for that. I mean, I, look, I'm not like an athlete person, but like, I don't, but I've heard the term pro hoes, like the girls that yeah. like flock all to the pros. All the, all the pro hoes come out. Sorry. All the pro hoes come out. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. It broke up for a second for there. So all the, yeah, all the pro hoes come out. They I think that's such a funny term. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just a different vibe. You know, LA is just different, you know, yeah. than New York. New York has a whole nother type of pro hoes, but, uh, <laughs> You know, especially, you know, with our, at the time, we didn't have the Brooklyn Nets yet. We just had the Knicks. Okay. A different type of pro hoes here. But they come out in their furs and their Knicks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so all these, so you're, so you're seeing all this. So you're feeling all kinds of things, I would imagine, because it's all getting magnified. And then what's happening? Um, obviously, there was a shift in our relationship. You know, our, our relationship kind of, it opened me up to mm-hmm. the realities of, this lifestyle that I had no idea would come to me, you know, came, it literally came to me. Um, and then, you know, even when my cousin was with me, I was still lonely, you know, uh, when he would mm-hmm. go and then when he would come home, he would still go out and there were times he would go out without me, leave me home with the baby, you know, you know, and so that was difficult. Um, but I think I learned, I will say this, the positive side of that is that, I learned how to be self-sufficient in many ways. You know, okay. I, learned, I had to learn how to cook for myself and my daughter, you know, and, and, you know, little things that, you know, I didn't have my mom or somebody help me. So little things like, for example, when we first went to LA, neither one of us had our license. Mm, LA, driver's license. A license. Yes. We didn't yeah. have a driver's license. And so I had to get my license. And so like little things like that, if I look at, the positive, I had to learn how to be self-sufficient. You know, okay. I had to- you were growing up quick. You had to learn yeah. how to grow. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So when did the second kid come into play? So we had our son, um, I think two years later, uh, in 2001. Mm-hmm. Um, he was born in LA. And um, at this point, Lamar started to slowly bring friends out from you know, from the East Coast. He started bringing friends from home, setting up shop, getting them a place to live. Um, and so once again, that adds to a layer of our relationship that um, we struggled with, you know, mm-hmm. that he's friends out. He has he's building his support and my support was dwindling. I would imagine he's getting attention from all kinds of directions because here he's a pro and he's getting not just the girls, he's getting media attention, all the things. And where does that leave you? And how are you feeling? Um, I think when we got our time, and I say we, meaning my daughter and myself and my son, I, I, I enjoyed it. Like I enjoyed our time, the little bit of time we got. The thing is that our time got less and less because he was yeah. trying, obviously. Um, and that was difficult. And I think at this time is when I became bi-coastal. I said, you know what? I'm going to go home and be with my family, my friends, get a little boost of whatever energy I can get from them. And then I'll come back to the West Coast. So that's when I kind of said I needed to kind of need, I needed that support too. And so for me to have that support, I needed to go home. So at this point, and I had my second kid and mind you, I'm like 23 maybe. Okay. So you're still super young. Yep. So- young and so, so I was like I'm gonna go back and forth um and so that's what I did but in going back and forth obviously our relationship you know looking back obviously we started to slowly 
I don't want to say grow apart, but mm-hmm. we started to to change our, okay. our relationship shift. Um, and then the little changes, the women more and more, the arguing, obviously, because of that. That was our biggest. Uh, that was our biggest issue. Were you in den- denial about the other women at all? Like, did you try to like think like it's okay? Maybe it's not as bad as I. Th- I think some women do that. Like, they want to look the other way. Like, maybe it's not as bad as I'm thinking. Maybe it's in my head. Did you have those conversations at all? Yeah, I think I thought after a few years of this now, um, and then the arguments we would have, mm-hmm. he would always tell me, "Those women mean nothing to me." You know, you're you're my family. You're the one I'm gonna marry. At this time, we got engaged. When prior to having our son, we got engaged. Mm-hmm. So at this point, he's telling me you're the one I'm gonna marry. And so I think after you're hearing that, after arguing, you're growing. He's honestly telling me exactly what I want to hear. And so mm-hmm. I kind of believe that it was kind of like, well, you know, these women are gonna be coming at him, and I love him, and we're a family, mm-hmm. and. Um, so I don't, I don't think I was necessarily looking the other way, but I was kind of like, well, we are his family. We're his priority. And, you know, these women, you know, at least he's not falling for any of these women or falling in love with any of these women. You know, unfortunately, I think I was telling myself that. I mean, I was in my twenties, you know, and like looking back, I'm just like, I've learned so much from being, from that, from that era. I mean, seriously. Um. It's, it's, yeah, things that I, I never would have put up with now. And I'm just like, but you know, I had, a, I had to kind of go through that. Obviously. Okay. So then where did the addiction and stuff come into play? Cause I know you were dealing a lot with managing walking through that. It started with marijuana, you know, okay. and that didn't, I knew he smoked a lot of marijuana, um, but that really just, you know, it didn't bother me. Uh, and you start to think, you start to normalize it. I would imagine like it's around yeah. all the time. You start to normalize yeah. it. Yeah, it became normal when we're in LA and, you know, Snoop is on the radio and Snoop, that's just Cali, you know, Sticky Green, all that stuff. So it was kind of normalized, especially mm-hmm. the West Coast at that time. And um, and so, yeah, it was totally normalized. I feel like the I would start hearing things probably like in 2004. Okay. Um, and but nothing serious as far as the heavy drugs, nothing serious. I think dabbling dabbling then I ended up getting pregnant with our third child Jaden in 2005 mm-hmm. um, and in 2005 three kids now and um he's with the Lakers now you know okay. for the Clippers he went to Miami for one year that was super tough <laughs> and Miami um mm-hmm. but then he was only there for one year got traded for Shaq actually mm-hmm. and then traded to the Lakers and now it's a whole other ball game. You know, now it's mm-hmm. kind of like you're going from the JV team to the varsity team to a whole other world, dealing with the Lakers and Kobe. Um, and so I think it just, it, it just blew up, it, you know, it was kind of like a volcano now. Now it's like erupting um, the pressure. The women are a whole other level. Um, and then he also had a different type of pressure professionally because now he really has to perform. You're with the Los Angeles Lakers. They're a dynasty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're a legendary team. Um, and so there was a lot going on at that okay. time. Yeah. And then that summer, 2006, unfortunately, we lost our son um, to a crib death. Oh, and, I can't um, even imagine. Yeah, that was, that was definitely the hardest moment of my life for sure. Um, it, um, we were in New York at the time visiting because Lamar's aunt had just passed away. So we came home for her funeral <sighs> and I think Jaden's crib death. And so was I somebody think, watching him? So he wasn't with you when this happened? We, we did have a, at this point when we had our third kid, I did have help. And so she came with us to New York and um, my mom was actually home that day. Also, she was actually home from work off that day. And I feel like it's so crazy because when I woke up that morning, I remember, and I even all these years later, I remember um, <coughs> um, waking up thinking, wow, he let me really sleep in today. Wow. 
because uh, yeah, he, he was a clockwork baby, like clockwork. And and he was my only um, breastfed baby. Uh, LJ took to it only for a couple of weeks, and then I ended up going um, um, using the breast pump and using the bottle. So I don't um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. After LJ, so yeah, I started using the bottle with LJ. Destiny did not take to, to the breast at all. So Jaden, who's a whole other level of bonding, actually took to the breast and uh, breastfed him for about two months, so or three months. So um, I was like, "Wow, he got to sleep in today." And I looked at the clock. I didn't hear him on our on our monitor, on our baby monitor. Um, and so that morning, it's it's still even as I'm describing it to you now, it's it's still very much very um, vivid and clear. Um, and yeah, we, we, we found him, the whole house was screaming, myself, um, my nanny, uh, Zonia, uh, her name was Zonia and my mom and, and, you know, and my kids, Destiny and LJ were, were little, but they were witnessing all of us and calling 911 and, um, and that was a really difficult time. And I feel like, and you know, Lamar was actually out that mm. night. He did not come home that night. He was partying with his friends out in Manhattan. We, we were living in Long Island at the time. And so um, I think the addiction, no, I know the addiction spiraled that summer because of all the guilt that he mm-hmm. felt. Home not being there. By the time he got to the hospital, Jaden was pronounced. And, um, you know, that summer, our relationship severed. Yeah. Which is pretty common. I've heard when you lose a a child like that. Um, so, wow. So I can't even imagine what you were going through with that. And it, and it sounds like, so it's almost like the the choice, it it sort of tore you apart more. And then his way to deal with it was maybe the, the, the partying and the, uh, the drugs I would imagine. Now that, and now we're talking heavy drugs. Now we're talking cocaine and we're not talking marijuana. And you knew that this was happening? Yeah, people started calling me. Um, they started hearing things, and people started calling me to warn me and to, you know. Um, but you know, I, I was dealing with so much. You know, I was severely depressed. Didn't really realize I was severely depressed um, because my family doesn't talk about mental health. I didn't grow yeah. up with mental health, and having those kind of deep conversations of trauma. Um, or saying, Hey, why don't you go talk to somebody, you know? Um, so I dealt with a lot that summer. And then at the end of the summer, the season for, for basketball starts like October. Um, and so the season was coming and Lamar was ready to go back to LA and I wasn't. And I think Jaden passing was so pivotal for me because I knew I had to stay in New York now. I wasn't going to go back to LA. I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. Um, I was not going to go back to LA, be by myself mourning the death of our youngest. Especially when he's out partying and doing, dealing with it that way. Dealing with it that way. And then starts traveling, you know, going with his team. And here I am with my two kids and no mom, no girlfriend, any of that support I'm not going to have. So I decided to stay in New York and, um, and I got my kids in a school in New York and we never went back to LA. Um, our relationship, I think because we were together for so many years, we struggled with what's next. Um, How did he take that though? When you said, I'm going to stay in New York with the kids. When you said, I'm going to go stay in New York with the kids and I'm, I'm, how did he take that? Was that like a relief? Was that an argument? What was he saying? Um, I think it, I, and I'm not like speaking for him, but I think I do, I know he was disappointed. Um, I think he felt confused. And, and the funny thing is, I think when he went back to LA, um, his friends actually told me, Lamar took the mattress from our bedroom and he actually brought it, he, he carried it down the stairway. We had a really extravagant stairway. And he brought it into the living room. And that's where he slept. Because Jaden, his crib was in our bedroom in L.A. And so he, um, 
I think it was extremely hard for him to go back to that house without us, you know, without his family. Mm. Um, and then he ended up selling, he ended up moving from that place. Um, he didn't want to stay there. I guess all the memories and, um, and I actually did the same thing. We ended up selling our place in the Maryland with Jaden Pass and we actually moved um, also. We didn't want to be there. So it was just a lot of movement um, physically and, and, and emotionally, a lot of movement that summer of 06. Um, but yeah, I think he felt betrayed and I think that's why he leaned on something that, drugs, that um, wouldn't leave him, you know? And, and it kind of gave him a bear hug. And um, I think, I would get the calls, concern, um, and from but him, I did, calls from him or calls from people concerned. Right. And oh. how was he being with your kids when he was here in LA and you're there in New York? Was he was he still involved with your kids? He was still involved, but I think he also was in his own world and um, own world, and meaning like his successes and the team at the time was getting better. And um, I think it, it became a little bit of an escape for him. Um, and here, me and my kids were here in New York trying to just pick up the pieces, you know? And now how old were your kids at this time? Ooh, um, I would say Destiny had to be maybe 10, maybe nine. And LJ was like six or five. So they were clearly asking about their dad, I'm assuming. So what was what were you telling them? They knew he was in LA at working, you know, working. They grew up with him being in the NBA and, and traveling and so working. And we would go visit, you know, holidays or whenever they had school days off, long weekends. We would totally go out there. Mm-hmm. But our relationship definitely started to pull apart. And, and um, what were you thinking about your relationship at the time? Were you thinking it's over? I'm just maintaining this for my kids. What was going on in your mind? I think I was confused because I'd been with him since I was like 17 years old. And um, and he was a father of my kids. And I, I just really wanted my family, you know, going back to the trauma of my parents' really unhealthy divorce. I think I, I really wanted my family and I was willing yeah. to for it. But I think once we lost Jaden, that the desire to, to fight for it, it just changed. And maybe that was my depression. You know, maybe that was my, um, you know, not um, not being fully engaged because I couldn't be, you know, because mm. I was broken and mourning. Um, and it took a couple of years of just Lamar and I living totally separate lives. Me just I had to, I had no choice but to pick up. I, I had the kids. So. so how would you feel when like you were hearing his name on the news or you were seeing him publicly? Like what was coming up for you? Um, I think just a little bit of confusion still. I think we went to that confusion. Where are we going with this? We're just taking a break. Um, we still love each other, but do we need to be together because we love each other? Maybe not. You're living in LA. I'm living in New York. I'm happy in New York. We're building a life. I have my kids in a great school. I'm making friends with their moms and doing play dates, and you know, going on school trips as a as a as a volunteer parent. So I'm like living a totally separate life than him, who's doing basketball and and you know and playing with the greats. You know, playing with Kobe Bryant, and we just totally live separate. And I think it, it finally got to a point. Um, I think it took a long time, you know, this didn't happen overnight. And then his, his drug use definitely picked up um, and it continued for years. Um, and then the summer of 2009, he actually met Khloe Kardashian. And that was a whole nother level now because even though he was a professional athlete and he was a Laker, we enjoyed privacy. You know, we didn't have paparazzi following mm. him. Married into the Kardashian family, it threw us into the fishbowl with him. Um, and that was brand new for me. Wow. It's um, everybody, paparazzi was following us. I remember being on a soccer field. My son was playing soccer at the time. And one of the moms was like, I think there's a guy over there in the corner taking your picture. And all you're trying to do is make a good life now in New York. Like you're kind of done with that. And now you're in this. I can't even imagine what that would feel like. Because you would, you never set out to be in that public eye or that. Right. So that it, it, it was a lot. It was a lot of 
you know, seeing somebody with a zoom lens in the corner being like a total creep. And, you know, you're like, oh my God. And then wondering what the heck they're going to say about you or what they're, what's the angle here? All the new people online. And so of course that happened and that was difficult for me, you know, being somebody who's so private and not looking for that, you know, life and being thrust into it and Mm -hmm. being compared to Chloe and, and, oh, Lamar has a type and all these headlines. And and it was really crazy. Um, And so we kind of went through those difficult times because then you have to remember that added a layer for my kids too. And them Mm -hmm. in the public world and traveling back and forth now seeing at the time, you know, Lamar married Chloe in 30 days. And so she became their stepmother. And so were you, were you feeling at all jealous or what was going on there? Not jealous. I was hurt. Um, I was hurt. Um, you know, Lamar, you know, he told me via text message that he was going to get married and that was difficult to get a text. You know, you couldn't even sit me down and that was difficult. And then on top of it, it was so public. You know, it's kind of like it was thrown in my face. You know, they got married on television and... That would be hurtful. I can imagine that would be very hard and hurtful. You're like, here, you you were high school sweethearts. You've got the kids. You've been all through this stuff. Like, you made some hard decisions and now it's like thrown on your face with like total gossip, you know? Yes. Can't even go to like a CVS or like a Walgreens. Oh, or like I can't even imagine. Tabloid covers. And so it was, it was so difficult. Um, it was so difficult and, but we got through it, you know, and, and Chloe and I, we, we had our moments of totally being cordial. Like she was their stepmom and I know she was trying her best. And, she and, were came, your kids, and how were your kids being handling this and what were you telling them and were they getting along they, with her? Yeah. They liked her. She treated them well. And to me, as long as you treat my kids well, we're good. Yeah. What happened was me being mama bear and being super protective. And then she came from a blended family. I didn't. So it was a little bit more difficult for me. And now like looking back, I probably could have handled things a little differently with her. Um, but also I think she also struggled with her power of being the wife. And so um, we kind of bumped heads a couple of times for sure. Um, but she was good to my kids. Rob was amazing. My kids loved Rob, uh, who would just hang out with them, play video games with them, just be a total kid with them. And I'll never forget that, that they always loved Rob and how he treated them. And so we went through that and, you know, but Lamar, the addiction was always there. And, um, you know, it was always something that kind of my family had to deal with. And, you know, I was diagnosed with depression in 2009 and, um, I had to do a lot of self-reflecting and, 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 and getting myself help because, and that all came in handy because when this happened with this explosion of press and attention on us, um, that all came in handy when I had to get my kids therapy because I definitely needed to get my kids therapy after the yeah. world. Um, now we're going back to like 2010, 2011. Um, um, sorry, did you hear that? I'm sorry, the windows okay. open. New York. <laughs> sorry. Um, that's why I stopped talking. Um, and so, yeah, I had to get my kids in therapy and that came in handy because at 14, my daughter was diagnosed with depression. Oh no. Um, on her dealing with you know the public and everybody knew and she'd go to LA and live a certain way and then come ha- come home and I'm trying to have that balance for my kids as yeah a very different life yeah I'd so, um so they they struggled with that they struggled with the pressure of it um and so that's something mental health has always been a discussion I'm trying to break that cycle that I didn't grow up with you know the generational like trauma and talking about our issues and I think and I feel like nowadays it's more common to break that stigma but I'm trying to do that with my kids and and addiction like we've had no choice like I've had to do my homework I've had to talk to specialists um because if I didn't I don't know where I would be and then what would Um, he what would he say now about your relationship Lamar yeah um He's told me before, he, 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 he totally respects me. He appreciates that I raised my, you know, I basically raised our kids on our own, on yeah. my own as a single mom. Um, he, you know, the day to day stuff, it was all me, um, decision to schools, what schools to put them in, 
all me. Um, and he, he acknowledges that. And I'm grateful that he acknowledges that. And then he how's it. your relationship with him now? We're totally cordial. You know, we'll always be family. I think, especially when his incident happened in 2015. Um, and what's the incident? Because people, people listening might not know. Right. In 2015, he actually OD'd he, in Vegas. Um, it was a, a whole thing. We actually thought he was going to die. It came to that point, um, as many people with addiction that struggle, when you don't get the help, it just keeps bubbling and bubbling. And, and we were concerned for about a year prior to him ODing in Las Vegas. And what did he OD on? Was it a combination of things? I think it was a combination. Um, I kind of checked out, you know, I wasn't reading the articles and stuff like that because we were like in it. And I just remember flying to Vegas, not knowing he was going to live, not knowing if he was going to die and thinking, oh my God, my kids are going to like lose their father. And um, once again, the therapy, talking about things, being honest, all of that came into play. Um, you can't hide it. Um, and so, especially because it was so public, you can't hide it. You have to have those tough conversations. Um, and, but Lamar lived and he couldn't walk and he couldn't talk. Uh, he literally had to learn, he was in a wheelchair and he literally had to learn how to walk again and, and do the, the rehab and the doctors and nurses were amazing over at Cedar sinai Um, and he had to do the, the mental work, the brain work, you know, he had 12 mini strokes. Um, and now he's walking and talking. He's about to be dancing with the stars. Um, so it's a true miracle. But I think tying it back into addiction and mental health, like Umar's always going to be an addict. Um, it's, it's the day-to-day battle. It's a day-to-day monkey on his back. Um, but I think the things that even now, like I'm speak, people are asking if I choose to speak out now. I mean, he wrote a book, um, dropped a couple of months ago. And we're mentioned in the book, and his struggles are mentioned in the book, um, and I'm mentioned in the book. And I feel like I need to tell our side of dealing with an addict. And the book is wild, and some of it I had no idea it happened. And when I do the math, I realized we were together at that time. Wow. Things that were happening in Miami, like in 2002, 2003, I'm like, we were together around that time. So, but it must have been hard reading that book from his, that perspective when it's yeah, like it's wild. Like, I, it was wild. And I think if I would have read the book five, six, seven years ago, it would have been, I would have been like, wow. But now it's like, we're just in a different time. In, in, I'm definitely in a different time in my life where it's like, we're always in the me family. Um, I don't hate him. I have, I have more empathy now seeing he's an addict and, and, and um, you know, he's the father of my kids. Like I want him to win, but I also want to, like I'm, I'm also trying now and I'm coming out to speak to people because I want to share our story, my kids and myself. Um, Cause other people, I feel like we're so, we get so like, involved with the addict and mm-hmm. we get pulled into that world of addiction. Mm-hmm. We forget about ourselves. Like I forgot about myself. I forget about my kids. And so now I feel like we have to, I want to talk to other families and of addicts and, because we put ourselves so much, we, we lose sleep, we have anxiety, we have depression, we worry about and relapsing. Um, mm-hmm. And we have to take care of ourselves and mm-hmm. live our own lives. And so I feel like it's important. Lamar has this platform and I feel like why not? He's put us into the fishbowl with him. So why not go out there and connect with other families and, 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 and doing that? And I know you know, Ellie, over at Mic Drop and yeah. up with them to kind of have this conversation um, and, and, and tying it together. I mean, especially now in our country, we know we have a huge problem with opioids and, and drugs in our country and addiction and, and mental yeah. health problems, but we're talking about it. That's the difference we're talking about. Yeah. It. Now, how was, so through, I'm, I'm just thinking timeline. So they got married and they they were, did they divorce before this whole, when he had that happen? And what, was that something she was walking through with you or were you not talking with her? She was definitely dealing with it. I was getting the calls, but she was dealing with it like in 2013. She was definitely dealing with it. We were not talking about it. Um, and I know she dealt with a lot, Chloe. Um, and she, she tried to help him. Um, she definitely did. He wasn't ready. We all know when an addict is not ready, you could, you know, 
put them in front of a fire. They're, they're just not going to do yeah. anything. Um, he ended up having the Vegas incident. He was in Vegas after their divorce. I think, you know, maybe a year or two. So he was really still struggling with his depression. And yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they, the timeline, they definitely were no longer married. Um, she definitely was struggling with, with him and his addiction towards the end of their marriage for sure. But she was trying to help. I, I was getting word that she was trying to get him in rehab and um, yeah, just, he just, he just wasn't ready. Yeah. What do you want people to know now from what you've learned? Um, I think just sharing your story. Not everybody has a platform, but we can connect um, and, 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 and so that we're not alone. You know, you're not alone. I think with me, I've done forums with like online forums for families with add, uh, dealing with addicts. And when I first did it, I covered my face. I, I put a piece of paper over the camera because I didn't want people. I changed my name. Um, but I was a little bit of shame. And, you know, I didn't know if people would, people who maybe watch, you know, read TMZ or whatever would, would put two and two together. And, but now I'm like, I'm not going to cover my face. Like, this is real life. We have real life issues. A lot of people deal with it, whether listen, addiction affects, it doesn't matter what color you are, what financial situation you have, um, what, what area code you, you live in. Um, I know plenty of people that are on Wall Street that are struggling with opioids or heroin or cocaine, major problem. Mm. It doesn't matter if you're in Wall Street or if you're living, you know, somewhere in, in an underprivileged neighborhood. But I feel like we all need to come together, be honest with our situations. And that's what I want to come out of it, like just communicating. And, and my daughter also, you know, she's in a different she generation X, Y, Z, I don't know. Yeah. So I feel like generation, even now, she gets people when she speaks out about being the daughter of an addict and what she's had to grow up with. And she'll get DMs from people like, oh, my father's an alcoholic and thank you for speaking out. And I feel like um, that's what it's about. Like, and it's for me too. Like I, I want, I, when I read DMs and people talk about mental health and they're like, oh, I'm glad you're speaking out about it. So I feel like that's what I want to get from this. Like just opening that conversation, having an organization and traveling and, and speaking to families and connecting with families and so that we're together. Cause I feel like we, we do kind of lose ourselves in the addicts and their mm-hmm. behavior. I want to be able to kind of connect with them too. So they know yeah. we're not alone. So what's, who are you today? Because you lived, uh, like your identity was really kind of taken from you. You became, you became like this young mom, you became the athletes, you know, girlfriend, fiance, you became the person helping hold everything together. You, you had all these different roles. Like, who are you now today as your kids get older and you've broken through a lot of this? You know, what's so funny is I'm still trying to figure all that out. So it's a great question. I had them so young and now I keep saying, like, I'm telling my, like, tell my kids this, I tell my girlfriends, like, this is my time. And they're like, well, when you say that, and I'm like, well, this is my time. Like my kids are older. This is my time to flourish in my career. This is my yeah. time to find new hobbies and to, which I really do want this to not necessarily be a hobby, but it's a passion project. Um, as far as with family to leave addiction yeah. and, you know, finding love. And, and I would love to have at least one more child with God, if God, allow mm-hmm, if, mm-hmm. my, if that's in my journey um and so I feel like today I'm just listen I'm just I'm winging it day by day I feel like um you know I'm still trying to learn more about myself and um every day like I you know I do need sometimes ask like what is happiness you know do we find mm-hmm. here on this earth or do we go through what we go through on this earth and then you find happiness in the next life you know those are the things that I'm still trying to figure all of that out. So like, yeah. who am I? Like, I know who I'm not. And I'm not the girl who's going to stay in a relationship that just because I want a family. Yeah. Um, I know I'm not that person that's going to beg and, and get on my knees for somebody to go to rehab and lose myself in their addiction world. Like, I'm not that girl anymore. Um, you know, so I feel like I know who I'm not. And, and yeah. I'm still figure out who, who I am and, 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 you know, and that's fine. Like I, you know, that's fine. That's yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I love that. 
What do you want the person listening right now to know if they are in a relationship with somebody that is struggling with addiction? What do you want them to know? Well, um, obviously try to get that person help, right? If you, if you know, or if you suspect, um, and if you, if they don't get the help, they are not ready. You really do have to focus on yourself, Mm -hmm. even if that means you have to walk away from the relationship. You know, you can't literally kill yourself trying to get somebody to get help. Um, and I think that's what I would want somebody to know. Like, you try your best, but don't lose yourself trying to get them. Because if they're not ready, they are not ready. Their parents can't get them clean. Their kids can't get them clean. A wife, I know people whose marriages have literally fallen apart. Um, you can't get that person help. They really have to want it themselves. Yeah, that's incredible. If somebody's listening right now and they're on their own personal rock bottom, um, maybe when you were dealing with the paparazzi following you around and you're lost or when you first found out you were pregnant, whatever that is to you, um, and you were, to, or even witnessing what Lamar went through with his rock bottom, somebody's listening and they're in their own personal rock bottom and you were to give them advice on what they can do to start changing and turning things around and leveling up, what would you tell them? It will pass. It will pass. I know when you're in the moment, and trust me, I know when you're in the moment, you can't see out of that all of those walls. Like you feel like you're literally trapped in, in, in these walls. But it will pass. Um, I leaned on prayer. Um, I leaned on my spirituality. Mm-hmm. I leaned on meditation. That's me. Um, but it really helped me. Um, uh, I, I think those are the best because I feel like I honestly, I couldn't really lean on friends. Um, I kind of struggled with it alone. And, um, so everybody's different. Some people, you may need to lean on somebody, but I, I would definitely get whatever self help, um, prayer, meditation, therapy, you know, I know therapy can be pricey if you can get therapy. Um, it will pass. You just have yeah. to hope, um, hope and think positive. You know, think positive. Because I feel like a lot of times that's what controls your path. You know, if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to have a really shitty day today, you will have a shitty day. You yeah, have totally. You have to say, I things may come my way, but I'm still going to have a good day today. Nothing perfect in this world. Especially. So true. So true. Thank you so much, Lisa. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for leveling up with us today. Please share this episode if you found it helpful so others can join in. And don't forget to hit that subscribe so you don't miss out on future shows. And if you would leave me a five-star review, I appreciate those so much. I read all of them and it's how I know that I'm giving you information that you find valuable. And come interact with me over on Instagram at Natalie Jill Fit. I read all the direct messages and comments over there. Make it a great day creating everything from nothing.